Commission has proposed to expand the list of European crimes to include hate speech. At the same time, a large part of uh, uh, MEPs uh, believe that pro-life speech is a fact, in fact, hate speech, and therefore constitutes a European crime. The right to express pro-life organizations uh, uh, is seriously, seriously menaced right now, and with it, the right to life. In fact, any political action in favor of the unborn and the right to life could be punished as a European crime. Uh, there is yet uh, another threat that refers uh, to Poland uh, will be addressed by Dr. Bauer Aonda Aka. Thank you very much. Uh, it is an honor to me, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I seen a film where you thank uh, Poland, uh, my country, and I am proud because I do not look like a typical uh, Pole, although I am a Pole. Stop fighting because we are at war. As uh, John Paul II uh, said, uh, this is the war of the civilization of death with the civilization of life. This war has many aspects, cultural aspects, uh, there are also legal aspects, uh, and there is also ideological aspects. Uh, and the threat uh, uh, to Poland uh, is enormous. Uh, President Macron has said that uh, he wants uh, uh, to include in the Charter of Fundamental Rights uh, uh, a deed of dehumanizing uh, unborn children. So, in other words, uh, this would be a genocide in the form of abortion, and we cannot uh, agree to that. And people in one of us uh, cannot agree to this either. Why? Uh, I would have a question to President Macron himself, uh, and to Mr. Giffer Hofstadt, uh, but not only them. I would have a question to a lot of MEPs in European Parliament. Uh, what happens uh, if we select who has the right to live and who must die, who must be murdered, annihilated? Uh, I do apologize for my emotions. Uh, however, uh, we have to be, we have to, uh, be aware of the fact that if we agree uh, for this practice, uh, uh, for this uh, terrible practice, such as abortion, if it becomes part of uh, the Charter of Fundamental Rights, uh, then we are going backwards to Sparta, to ancient Sparta, where some people were selected uh, in order to live or die. Uh, and uh, people with disabilities uh, were killed, uh, and it would be the same right now. And I would have another question, a private question, personal question. If I am not able to reach uh, a cup of coffee, if I am not able to feed myself, is my life less worthwhile than the life of our dear friend Joanna? Uh, this is an absurd question, because the answer is no. Each and every life is worth uh, being, is worth existing. It also includes the life of unborn children. M Mr. Macron, regardless uh, of uh, whether we are talking about uh, disabled people or unborn children, uh, regardless of uh, uh, the color of the skin, uh, the level of disability, every life uh, sh should be protected. Uh, I thank you very much. Uh, it is an honor to me. I am really honored that I could uh, address you today.
Thank you very much uh, for your testimony. Poland uh, will have to fight this battle in order to maintain its uh, integrity and to protect the voice of their citizens. Uh, today, we would like to underline the courage of Poland uh, and we would like to tell Poles uh, that they can count on us uh, so that we can weather the storm and protect the voice of life in Europe. Thank you so much. Yeah, listening to uh, the updates of uh, Marilise John and uh, the statement uh, by Dr. Bohr. Um, we have been setting the stage for a round table discussion. And since we are running out of time fast, uh, I want uh, to ask the people contributing um, to keep your story short. There will be short statements uh, followed by a discussion. Um, again, short statements uh, so that there is time for uh, some interaction. Um, in order, instead of Giuseppe from uh, Italy, um, Camille Galuppi will speak. Yeah. Uh, she's a historian, the youngest president of Pro-Life Center in Italy, a member of the National Consiglio Direttivo of the Italian Pro-Life Movement, and she is part of the youth equipe of the Pro-Life Movement in uh, Italy. After her, Clotilde de la Motte from Belgium uh, will speak. She is 22 years old, a student in psychomotricity. New to pro-life engagement, she came to Belgium from France for her studies and she met the organizations, organizer of the March for Life and got involved with them. Then the floor will be to Aliette Espreu from France. She is 23 years old, pro-life activist and spokesperson for the March of Life in France since 2020. She is also the founder of the Generation Pro-Life Generation Pro Movement. She is a double master student in philosophy and management. And finally, Maria Formosa from Malta. Uh, she is currently studying for a Bachelor of Commerce and Accountancy in Malta. Um, Children have always been close to Mariah's heart. And as a result, over the past few years, she has been strongly pro-life and protecting the right to life from conception to natural death. Camille, yes, good time morning. for a short statement. Good morning, I will go short. Uh, I want to talk about um, um, initiative that we have in Italy, that it's heart to heart. Heart to Heart uh, wants to prove that the link between women and life is indisputable. In our society, compared to the past, uh, women have a bigger role and they know um, the contribution they can give to society. And in this perspective, we think that it's fundamental for women to share the maternity journey and to um, share also uh, feeling heart to heart with the child they had in the womb, in the womb. And this closeness is unique. Any, any time in our life, we cannot experience something similar. The heart to heart connection is one, and we have to use the, this testimony to make clear that um, the, the, the child in the womb is one of us. And we are very proud uh, about this project because it was uh, before, um, before everything, it was idea, only an idea. And this idea went to, uh, was from Carlo Casini, that it's our uh, founder in Italy.
and he wrote, he um, created a, a, gr a strong group in Italy, and now we have this reality that it's continue to, um, to work and continue to um, testimony the beautiful of life. And now we have the Mother Prize, uh, the, the Mother Ter uh, Teresa of Calcutta Prize that is, was given to Chiara Corbella and Irene of um, Nomadelfia and also to um, Pietrangeli Paluzzi. And these are, these are women that uh, experienced um, the, the, the solidarity uh, that came and heart to heart wants to make loud and strong the voice of women in defense of the nascent life and prove that they're bold to the right of life of conceived children. The Macron is a right amongst. Uh, if you want to join the manifesto, heart to heart, uh, there will be on the desk outside the paper where everything is written down. And you can go to the um, uh, website of one of us or the website of the Italian Movement Pro Life. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Camilla, for your. Um for your work on the situation in Italy, where uh, from scratch you have been starting initiatives to mobilize uh, a pro-life movement. Now uh, to the situation in Belgium. What are your experience, Clotilde? <clears throat> Bonjour à tous. Um, good morning to all of you. I'll tell you about the situation as far as abortion is concerned in Belgium. It was depenalized in 1990, in 2018. It was uh, uh, taken away from the uh, penal code, uh, in uh, criminal code, sorry. In uh, uh, 2018, a uh, uh, bill was passed to improve the access to abortion. Uh, that is what it pretended. It uh, would uh, uh, extend the, uh, the timeline from 12 to 14 uh, uh, weeks. Uh, the uh, uh, renunciation right would be decreased from eight to three days, and no alternative uh, uh, could uh, be uh, granted to abortion, even though the current law uh, provides for uh, assistance and alternatives that are not implemented by the abortion centers. They do not respect uh, the, this piece of legislation. And the withdrawal of the uh, conscience clause, uh, as it is called, which means that no um, place uh, uh, would have the possibility to refuse an abortion. It is a bill that has not been passed as yet, but that might be adopted in the future. Um, the uh, euthanasia was uh, um, authorized uh, in 2022, uh, 22, uh, 20 years ago, and it has been extended to underage uh, children, which means that uh, it, uh, it is covering children as well as uh, people who are in a coma. The, the uh, possibility is now to extend euthanasia to people with dementia, people who are conscious and who do not suffer according to the terms of a law. Those people can be euthanized. And since uh, March 2021, no old age center, no uh, healthcare service can refuse euthanasia being practiced on the facilities. And we uh, do not talk uh, about uh, palliative uh, health care, uh, not uh, in a sufficient manner. Uh, those uh, uh, those uh, health care only uh, postpone death. Uh, they offer uh, many possibilities to uh, alleviate the pain. And it is very often a service that uh, eases the pain of uh, the people who are suffering. The March for Life has been launched 10 years ago and is now organized uh, by the association called Clara Life. Uh, we have a wish through that association to support and defend uh, life. Uh, we work with the most disadvantaged. Uh, we provide them with uh, a pragmatic uh, support. Uh, we work with uh, pregnant women, handicapped people, and people who've reached the end of their lives. Uh, we would like to restore uh, a culture of life uh, through Clara Life, uh, through the 
training that uh, help people understand how to best to support these people, give them back their dignity and insufflate a new hope. Thank you very much. Thank you, Clotilde, uh, for emphasizing that pro-life is not only about uh, fighting abortion, but also um, to care for uh, the elderly and for people suffering. Thank you very much. Um, then to the experiences in France, back after my release, uh, we are back in France. Um, Aliet, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning. The um, March for Life is a movement in France that was founded after the legalization of the Veil legislation. Today, it brings together more than 20,000 people each year in the streets to defend the rights of the ones that society increasingly despises the child in utero. Founded on the desire to defend human life from conception to natural death, the March for Life is also committed to the fight against assisted reproduction, manipulation of the embryo in research, surrogacy, and euthanasia. Since 75, in fact, eugenics law have followed on one another in France. First and foremost, they are seeking to extend abortion times, as was the case with this year with the Alban Gayo laws adopted last March, with, which extend, sorry, abortion from 12 to 40 weeks. The goal is to make it one day completely free, without limits and without delays. Their goal is to reduce humans in their most vulnerable, vulnerable states to a vulgar cluster of modifiable, destructible, quantifiable, and commercial cells. The new five-year term of our president, Emmanuel Macron, is therefore not a good news for France, but also for the whole of Europe, since he has given himself the mission to including abortion in the charter of the European Union. This five-year term also announced the advance of euthanasia in France and possibly the abolition of the con conscience clause specific to abortion for the medical profession, a clause that governments have already tried to abolish twice in a few years. However, despite the progress of these laws, the March for Life in France resists and its supporters grow every year. Ironically, the more these laws advance, the more people join us, considering that the government is going too far. Admittedly, we have lost battles. The government is consi consistently trying to prohibit any possible action against abortion. Obstructing is punishable by two years in prison and at least 13,000 euros fine. But we are not defeated for, for all that. Today in France, there are several thousand young people who mobilize each year within our annual march and who continue to act throughout the year, gathering in that city and constituting the network of the pro-life force. These young people are the pro-life generation presented by Marilis. They gather today in more than 20 cities in France with the aim of making the voice of the innocent heard everywhere around them. Some approach association to support women in difficulty, thus helping them to keep their child. Some devote themselves more to action on the ground in the streets, while others make the voice of, the, of life roots through social networks. Within March for Life, we are fully aware of the difficulty to the, of the tax we, to which we dedicate ourselves every day. We also know that we will win, that these children will win, and that the days will no longer be counted the way that they are today. We know this more than we believe it, because truth has always won over lies, and good has always won over evil. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I hear some optimism in your uh, story. We will win in the end. And that's why we are here. Uh, of course, all of us, we are believing more or less that whether in the short run or in the long run, we will win. Um, some countries are closer to winning than others. Um, how is the situation in Malta? So, Maria, the floor is yours. Good morning. Um, Malta is one of the very few remaining countries in Europe that offers full protection to the unborn child. This is not without its challenges. The mentality of youth and society at large is shifting. The protection of human life has become less important than the so-called reproductive rights and healthcare. 
terms which are being exploited to hide the fact that an innocent child is being killed. As many of you know, numerous studies exhibit remarkable consequential effects on women who undergo an abortion procedure, including detrimental effects on their physical, mental, and emotional health. These women, together with those experiencing an unplanned pregnancy, need all the support necessary to remain in good holistic health, which Malta currently offers. By being pro-life, Malta is also pro-women. Malta offers a number of support services to mothers and their families. Exactly one year ago, together with my colleagues, Ice Life was founded. As a pro-life youth organization, apart from defending the unborn, Ice Life also aims to support such organizations in their daily work. In fact, one of our events during the past year was Grant a Wish, where, we, where during Christmas time we collected gifts for children and mothers who reside in one of the shelters for women facing an unplanned pregnancy. In addition, we are currently collecting food for a number of other shelters, which provides, provide refuge for children and families facing difficulties. It is no secret that the younger generation has a crucial role to play in the pro-life movement. Contrary to what many believe, Malta hosts a lot of pro-life youth, but many are unfortunately afraid to speak up in favor of life. We need to provide the right platforms for youth to be inspired, supported, educated, and empowered to become a force in, the, in our pro-life movements. Furthermore, from first-hand experiences and encounters with unsure youth, the stigma that the pro-life movement is comprised only of conservative, hostile, and older adults must be eradicated. Today's generation is very much knowledge-based, with education teaching young people to base their decisions on factual material proven by numbers, calculations, and statistics. By educating youth with the facts that pro-choice individuals often hide, such as the repercussions on the mother's physical and mental health post-abortion, our youth may feel empowered to speak up in favor of life. Let us all make a difference. Our difference may only be a drop in the ocean, but without that drop, the ocean would not be the same. May we be witnesses for our youth to engage in healthy discussions and ultimately be the voice for the voiceless and rise as one united front. In conclusion, being here today is already a big step in inspiring other youth to speak up in the pursuit of protecting life from the very beginning. This is why we require effective education, which, um, which prepares youth to understand what it really means to abort your own child, and so to defend life in all possible ways. This shall empower us to become activists and make a significant change in supporting women, children, and society as a whole. This is what we have been striving for, especially during the past year, because I See Life is all about inspiring, supporting, educating, and empowering. And for our world to flourish, we must all join forces, cooperate, and be united as one. This is the way forward. Dear friends, we believe that being human is all about love. In a world full of apprehension and adversity, it is time to stop the death of the innocent crying in the womb. Every mother must be provided with the power of protection because we believe that life is precious. All life is precious. All life matters and no one should ever be forgotten. Let us remember our roots and restore a culture of love. Because with all of its struggles, life is beautiful. And by this, may we never forget that each child in the womb is also one of us. On behalf of the Maltese youth and IC Life, I thank you very much. Maria, thank you very much. C'est magnifique. Uh, On peut vraiment les... les... Les applaudir. Applaudissons.
Thank you very much. Uh, we can give them a big applause. Uh, Maria, Ariet, Hans, Bauer, and uh, Alet, and uh, Giuseppe. Thank you very much uh, uh, for these messages uh, who are a sign of hope uh, and of our fight in the European Union. The second part of uh, this uh, con conference will uh, deal uh, with the incredible wealth we have in Europe, uh, life, uh, free that are currently threatened, but that are nevertheless the only possible value if we want to uh, pave the way for the future of Europe. We are going to uh, display a short uh, video. Thank you to the uh, previous speakers, and I will invite uh, Jaime to come and join us here. Today, Parliament sends a message to everyone out there. Europe is an LGBTIQ freedom zone. That means sexuality, education, fertility treatment, legal and safe abortion. So to deliver on the strategy's objectives, the Commission will make full use of the tools at its disposal. The anti-abortion law in Poland has been exceptionally harmful and changed the daily lives of Polish women and girls. Good day to everyone. Thank you very much to all of uh, you who from uh, many European countries have uh, come today, this uh, Saturday morning here to Brussels. The event that we are celebrating today in Brussels is uh, driven by the Federation of One of Us organizations and by the platform of one of us European thinkers. And it arrives at a crucial moment, clearly symbolic, and due to two reasons. Because of the end of the reflection process on the future of Europe that was launched by the European institutions, and also due to the tragedy of the war in Ukraine. The war in Ukraine, until now, has shown us that uh, Europe and the European Union were headed towards nothing. They were fleeing from the truth as though it were the plague, based on this sickly obsession of reinventing human nature, the culture of life, family and trying to replace, to substitute, and to destroy a social order that is based on Christian foundations by a ruthless and a growing social disorder. Also, based on this suicidal obsession of affirming that Europe has ceased to be Christian, as President Macron apparently believes, and trying to take abortion to form part of the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. How sad that after 
fracturing socially France, President Macron now is trying to socially fracture the basics of Europe. The war of Ukraine reminds us that we have uh, been busy in issues of gender, of transgender, of transhumanism, abortion. This is, we've been busy with lies and we've forgotten of the truth. The truth of the need to defend the culture of a civilization, the need to secure our energy for our independence. And first and foremost, above all else, the social, the moral, spiritual, and religious dimension of Europe, of our civilization, and of we Europeans. Sometimes some of our adversaries can even accept that our roots are Christian, but that they belong to the past. However, for us, for many, the foundations are more than just simple roots anchored in the past. They are essential elements of our present and foremost of our future, never by trying to impose and always trying to give more value to freedom. Better late than never, they say. In this uh, task of rectification, regeneration of the union, we need to know how to change, starting by one's self, starting by ourselves. We cannot close ourselves up in our country, in our nation, in our own selves, in our own organizations. We cannot resign ourselves. We cannot be part of a conspiratorial silence before this cultural process that is forced upon us by the dominant trends. We need to know how to be together. We, the Europeans that defend the Christian foundations of Europe, we need to know how to add others to our cause and we need to dedicate more time to trying to find others to join us, to add believers and non-believers. But that after all, defend the same foundations. And we also need to know how to be politically incorrect by affirming that the lack of a faith is the greatest of causes that explain the crisis that we behold before us. We need to be humble, but at the same time, we need to be ambitious. And we need to be capable of presenting a cultural alternative, a global alternative that is based on the defense of life, that is capable of liberating intelligence, the intelligence of the Europeans from a dominating trend, as Remy Brac has reminded us, and something which we did centuries ago vis-a-vis -vis slavery. una convención con el objetivo de avanzar en la naturaleza y en el desarrollo de esta alternativa cultural. Es un paso más. Europa necesita nuestra existencia, nuestra presencia, nuestra perseverancia, 
de notre courage, de notre capacité à souffrir également pour défendre notre conviction en les fondamentos cristianos de notre civilisation. Cher, cher Raimé, merci infiniment pour tes mots. Euh, plein plein d'énergie, plein de force, euh, plein d'espérance. Et nous appelons, euh, chacun d'entre nous, à beaucoup d'engagement de, et beaucoup de, de renoncement pour servir la vie. Nous sommes à tes côtés. Euh, je, je voudrais maintenant que nous envoyions une, une petite vidéo euh, sur la vie, la culture de la vie, qui sera après ça commentée par deux grands témoins euh, de la vie. Euh, vous connaissez bien entendu Anna Zaborska et puis vous connaissez peut-être moins bien, en tout cas en ce qui me concerne, Paolo Floris, qui viendront nous, nous commenter euh, cette vidéo. S'il vous plaît, euh, pouvez-vous nous envoyer la vidéo sur la vie, la défense de la vie en Europe Merci. Je souhaite que nous puissions actualiser cette charte, notamment pour être plus explicite sur la protection de l'environnement ou la reconnaissance du droit à l'avortement. Accueillons euh, Anna, qui est une que vous connaissez bien, qui est une. We welcome uh, Anna, whom you uh, all are well now, who is an uh, un relentless, uh, relentless uh, defender of uh, life in Europe. Uh, she's fighting for life and human dignity. She is uh, from Slovakia, and it is a, a remarkable person. So please uh, give her as an applause. Monsieur le Président, chers amis. Dear uh, President, dear uh, friends of life, it is uh, uh, a great pleasure for me to be here with you today, and I thank you very much for having invited me. The uh, reminiscence of the emerge and the creation of one of us uh, are, are very strong for me. The names of Carlo Cassini and Jaime Major Oreja, as well as uh, Ana del Pino, are forever associated with uh, the creation of this movement and will remain forever written in my heart. Uh, Conferences like today's are a place where ideas and values uh, can be debated. Uh, in uh, the political world, uh, ideas are used to better understand how society works, uh, whereas values are politicians, uh, a compass uh, on which decisions will be made. Um, that is the reason why values are at the core of uh, politics. We could ask, ask ourselves how we can promote the protection of human life and uh, human dignity in politics. Uh, I would uh, uh, say that uh, the uh, question how should always be preceded by a reflection on uh, the question why. Why do we care so much about society protecting human lives and the dignity of every one of us? Uh, 
as Christians, our answer would be because uh, uh, the truth that is uh, being revealed uh, and the natural law order us to do so. But why should uh, the rules of society be shaped uh, according to the Christian faith? Why should uh, the catechism of the Catholic Church be binding on a people and uh, other faith and the infidels? Such questions very often resonate, and many people have considered that we as Christians do not have a right to impose our rules on others. We are not obliged to abort. No one obliges us to, to take hormonal contraceptives. No one is forcing us to request euthanasia. Why then can we not uh, accept uh, other people's uh, uh, freedom to decide for themselves? Well, it is simple. If solidarity and justice are to work in society, Every person's life must have the same value. And because uh, just as death is the only reliable indicator of the end of life, conception is the only reliable indicator of the beginning of this life. We systematically defend humanistic uh, um, value according to which uh, our all lives are equal, or the uh, life of an unborn children to Catholic parents uh, should uh, have the same protection or should be guaranteed the same protection as any other unborn child. Let's now come back to the question, how? What we are actually asking is a double request. How are we are supposed to have a public debate about the protection of human life and its dignity? And the next question is, what tools can we promote uh, to uh, have uh, a generally binding rules in uh, a representative uh, democracy? We are convinced that we hold the truth, but that doesn't justify that we deny the human dignity of people who do not share our vision of uh, the beginning and end of life. We are the ones who fend for the value and dignity of every person. The way in which we discuss and try to convince our fellow citizens must be in full consistency with this conviction if we want to gain trust in those discussions. And for those of us who try to increase the protection of human life and its dignity by the state, its policies and laws, consistency should be the rule of gold. If we say that the main reason for changing the view of unborn human lives is that the life of every person at every moment of its existence is the highest value in society, we must uh, then consistently promote this principle in all political areas. Indeed, a policy that is inspired by the culture of life uh, concerns as much the right of a conceived child, uh, of an unborn un conceived uh, child, as uh, it concerns the right of all of us to be treated with dignity when uh, sick and helpless. Our civilization was born and developed on Christian values. It is a fact, and as a such, uh, uh, we can not uh, contradict uh, the religious beliefs and uh, um, actions of European citizens. And if we do not uh, accept uh, these historic values, we introduce a very worrying negativisms in social life. We cannot build uh, the European house uh, whilst uh, twisting history. 
And I would like to thank uh, uh, every one of you who, through your activities, uh, uh, contribute uh, not only in preserving, but also in developing and uh, embodying the values and roots that we believe in and on which we've all grown up. I bought your work uh, in the interest of a common good. And dear friends, uh, allow me to say that the respect for human rights and dignity is real politics. Thank you very much. Merci, Anna. Nous savons combien toute votre vie est en cohérence. Thank you very much, uh, Anna. We do know that uh, your life and your acts are fully consistent with what uh, you have uh, just uh, told us, which was a wonderful testimony. I would now like to invite uh, Mr. Paolo Flores, who is the director of the Public Administration and member of the Family and Life Committee in Italy. Thank you very much, Mr. Flores. Dear President, dear speakers, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to warmly thank the Confederation, one of us, for the invitation to take part in this very important uh, convention that is uh, taking place very close to the final reflection of the European institutions that will take place on the 9th of May. These are uh, dramatic uh, days. We are seeing uh, the war in Ukraine, and this is following another very dramatic period, uh, the pandemic. In this period, the future of Europe looks more and more like the ability to build again a Europe that is an institution. It's not a theoretical abstract model. International doctrine itself struggle with the finding a definition of the legal nature of the EU. It's mainly technocratic institutions that prevail in Europe. In other terms, the institution has not proven to be able to create a joint identity. In the long post-war period, in the second part of the 20th century, for the first part, for the first time, Western societies could access a mass freedom. However, political institutions cannot handle this freedom anymore. And why is that so? Because Europe itself was in the front line uh, before this request of freedom, but the freedom was constructed upon the idea of absolute full autodetermination of the individual, not of the person. And individual is a logical and not anthropological concept. This uh, request of uh, freedom and freedoms demanded getting rid of any link. Social link, that is the family. Economic link, let's think about uh, the deregulation on the financial market and so on. What was the final result? The result of this uh, freedom movement deeply and uh, drastically transformed men from producer to consumer. And uh, this created the liquid life, as Bauman said, where individuals constantly fluctuate between looking for relationships and fearing that stability of relationships limit the ability to create new relationships, then political institutions should possibly reply by creating laws that are not limited to mere proceduralism, because uh, use publicistic at the beginning of the 20th century, we have to understand that uh, laws should be based on what is evident 
we cannot reflect only on the basis of a preset uh, categories. Sophocles said already, unwritten laws live not just now and yesterday, but always, and no one knows from when they came into being. What are the rights that we have to protect the most? The first one of them is a right to life. It is uh, put into question constantly. The same principle of unavailability of light is on the table. And in Italy, although the word euthanasia is uh, never used in the draft law, there is an attempt of introducing euthanasia in uh, the Italian legislation. Recognizing a human being, human persons, misrecognizing basic rights. Also, learning the meaning of this right can only happen in the natural society called family. This is what the Italian constitution states. Every human being is a subject and not an object. And this is true since conception, the first moment. Abortion is a wound that the world needs to heal. Wounds are numerous for women that cannot uh, welcome life, for men, fathers who cannot be fathers, to families uh, that cannot uh, welcome a new human being. And it is also a wonder for um, society and for solidarity, which is at the basis of uh, human um, co-living. On the 21st of May in Rome, there will be a great event. And we would like to encourage everyone to take part uh, in our uh, family day. We want to remember the whole of society that recognizing inherent dignity of uh, all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. We should reflect also on what Mother Teresa of Calcutta said, until abortion will be seen and proclaimed as a right, the world will never have justice nor peace. Thank you. Buongiorno a tutti e scusate il ritardo. Good morning, everybody. I apologize for being late. My plane was two hours late. Good morning, everybody. I finally made it. I'm finally here. Thanks, everyone, to all the people uh, who took the floor before me. Thank you to Ana Del Pino for the organization. Thank you to Mr. Oreja. Apologies, my mouth mask and fell on the floor. Thank you, Mr. Flores, as well. Thank you for your intervention. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce a new video aimed at uh, announcing the second panel, the defense of freedom for the future of Europe, freedom of conscious religion and expression. Here is the video. My wish for 2021 is that all human rights activists come together and mobilize against the anti-gender and anti-LGBTI movement. The Hungarian bill is a shame. And uh, I've instructed my responsible commissioners to write a letter to the Hungarian authorities.
Ecco, innanzitutto anche... First of all, I would also like to congratulate everyone for the videos. They are all very well done. Now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Gaines from Belgium. He's a philosopher. In this uh, section, we will hear different philosophers. Michel, you have the floor. Uh, tout d'abord, je voudrais remercier let me uh, first of all uh, thank one of us uh, for having invited me and i would also like to congratulate uh, that movement for their action for their commitment uh, uh, on behalf of uh, life uh, and the defense of life which is absolutely uh, essential in uh, the current situation what is a uh, freedom it is uh, a uh, concept that has been worked on by many philosophers and it is it resonates uh, very strongly strongly nowadays we are all uh, in favor of freedom it is kind of a magic word that everyone agrees with but what is freedom nowadays our uh, freedom is uh, um, very often a uh, synonymous to the absence of any constraint that would prevent an individual to do what uh, they want satisfy all their desires uh, in short uh, it amounts to people doing whatever they think is good for them every one of us is uh, supposed to be free to decide what is good or bad for uh, for us there is no truth uh, the only truth uh, is uh, the truth for oneself what is a freely decided to uh, consider as true will be true. Therefore, truth, objective truth, is uh, considered as a constraint that would uh, be contrary to my freedom. And we can see the consequences of these uh, radical postmodern uh, conception that is a very egotistic uh, conception of a freedom uh, that are dramatic. Obviously, uh, there are limits uh, to my freedom. This limit is the freedom of other human beings. But who are the other human beings? Since there is no truth, we are free to decide that, for instance, an embryo, an unborn child, an Alzheimer a patient, are not authentically human. They are, to a certain extent, subhuman. And therefore, if the existence of an unborn child or an Alzheimer patient is a burden and an obstacle to my freedom, it becomes legitimate to put an end to their lives, especially if those people do not have the capacity to, uh, ex to uh, enjoy their uh, freedom and uh, uh, if they do not have the capacity to freely oppose my will to put an end to their days. Against this postmodern ideology of freedom and truth, we must refuse any type or reject any type of discrimination between human beings and forcefully affirm this great truth, i.e. the unconditional equality of all human beings without any distinction without any exception. The authentic freedom is not the absence of any constraints. It is not a postmodern concept. There are constraints everywhere, but it is a perfect coincidence between what we want and uh, what we really are deep inside. And therefore, to enjoy full freedom means to live in for full accordance with uh, what is enshrined in our human nature. That was uh, told by Aristoteles. But in the framework of Christianity, which values are at the core of our uh, civilization, our natural aspiration is to love and to be loved. Of course, we have the possibility to decide whether we want or not to uh, uh, meet this uh, aspiration, but the truly free life requires an adequacy of self to self in the love of God and man. Such a freedom, an authentic freedom, can only uh, be deployed in full and absolute respect of all human lives without any type of exception. Thank you very much.
Grazie a Michel Jean. Gra Thank you, Mr. Gaines. Uh, the freedom to love and be loved. Now it is a great pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Rocco Buttiglione. In Italy, he is very well known. Thank you very much. For the time being, he is uh, teaching at um, Lateran University in uh, Rome. He has been an MEP and uh, speaking about uh, freedom and uh, religion. He has been uh, a victim of discrimination at uh, the European uh, Parliament after having said what he thought, although he had been very reasonable in uh, his uh, speech. I will let him the floor. Grazie. Thank you. I don't want to speak about the past, not at all, but I would like to, to think about uh, a couple of uh, dear friends uh, that uh, passed away recently. Michel Scoyens from Belgium and Francesco D'Agostino in Italy. He, they left our era and they entered another era that is endless. Noi chiediamo. What we are asking is a free cultural debate on the right of the child, of the unborn child. We are asking ourselves, is the unborn child one of us? If he or she is one of us. What is the degree of legal protection that is due to the baby? This debate is not close at all. Let's assign the results of the biological science that will be exposed later by someone who is more competent than me. Simply, I would like to point out uh, to the fact that millions of Europeans are deeply convinced that uh, the unborn child is a human being and has the right to life. These European citizens have uh, different uh, political um, convictions. So they cannot be labeled as non-Europeans or anti-Europeans. This conviction was shared by the founding fathers of the Union. We are ready to listen counter arguments, but what we do not accept is a sort of new inquisition persecuting those who defend the rights of the unborn child, excluding them from the civil debate. In the weeks to come, very likely the Supreme Court of the United States might state that the abortion is not a constitutional right. In many European uh, countries, let's forget for a second uh, Poland or uh, uh, Malta or Hungary, Italy and uh, Germany, among other countries, consider abortion not as a right, but as a moral evil that for some fun reasons is not prosecuted, uh, juridically speaking. And it is unacceptable to elevate it to the level of a fundamental right. We are willing to listen to the pain and suffering of women who believe that they cannot carry on with their pregnancies for a variety of reasons. We understand that God has entrusted the child to the mother in such an intimate way that it is extremely difficult to defend the baby against the mother. A real debate on abortion that must be open in our society should look for policies that defend the child, strengthening the alliance between the mother and the child, reconciling the freedom of the mother with the right to life of the child. That means policies that uh, support uh, women and give them the freedom to become mothers. We know that in our society, this freedom is uh, severely restricted. Our struggle is not a struggle against uh, women. It is a struggle for the baby and for the mother. Some believe that a good way to fight against poverty is uh, 
making poor children die even before they are born. What we want is rather a society where children of uh, poor people are welcomed. The European anthem emphasizes the joy of uh, human brotherhood. Brotherhood. In the Ninth Symphony by Beethoven, the lyrics say, brethren, beyond the serious sky, there must be a father who loves us. How can we be brothers if they're not children of the same father? Thank you, Mr. Buttiglione. Thank you also for having mentioned uh, the European anthem that should be the basis of our European Union. That is joy. And now let's move on to the third panel. May truth be expressed, the truth of uh, one of us, that maternity and pregnancies are a good thing for us and for society. To speak uh, about uh, the future of Europe, we'll first have a look in the video. Education sexual, la contraception et l'avortement occupe une place centrale dans l'émancipation des femmes. It's totally inacceptable that un tribunal. It is totally unacceptable that a constitutional court controlled by the government of Mr. Kaczynski wants to attack one of the fundamental principles, which is the freedom of women to make decisions about our own bodies, to make decisions about our maternity. The most important thing is a call for universal access to SRHR for all countries all around the EU without any discrimination. That means sexuality, education, fertility treatment, legal and safe abortion. Let's uh, repeat this. Abortion is not a right. Abortion is uh, violence. Violence uh, towards uh, mothers, women, children in uh, the womb towards a society. Let's say it loud and clear. Now I would like uh, to invite uh, Christian Frey, theologian, theologian and ethicist from uh, Germany. Why stand up for the truth? Why defend the truth? Ladies and gentlemen, the 7th of May is a special day. 77 years ago, the Second World War ended in Europe. Today, without this turning point, European unification seems essentially inconceivable. We live in a peaceful and united Europe. But we have to know, a liberal state live on pre, lives on preconditions that it cannot guarantee himself. A hundred years ago, the application of scientific concepts of population and health policy was widely discussed. Only in the post-war period, eugenics did become increasingly unpopular. 
Nevertheless, the idea did not disappear. Now we know there is no race in humans and every theory of race is nothing more than an ideology without a scientific basis. So the question is, how can European states and Europe preserve a socio-political homogeneity of basic values under the conditions of freedom? The European Commission is now making great efforts to overcome discrimination. We have heard it. In this horizon, Europe serves as a founding instrument. The goal is gender equality in the European research area. This is to be achieved by means of gender mainstreaming. So we are seeing a strong steering measure by the Commission. The Commission is using a hard power tool to coerce our universities and research institutions to do what they want. Those who do not comply have no access to Brussels money pots. By disregarding fundamental values of the European Union, the Commission is reshaping the European research area according to the Commission's agenda. I cannot shake off the impression that the European institutions are selling Europe's own soul right now. How could we not defend the truth? Gender mainstreaming has its basic assumptions. One of them is the postulate that gender is essentially socially determined. Thus, thus we have a distinction between social gender and biological sex. We have to ask one question. Does this correspond with reality? I think not. If we reinvent the human being in a way that does not correspond to human nature and reconstruct society accordingly, someone will pay the price. Usually, the marginalized of so, uh, by society. How can we, as one of us, not fight for the truth to defend the dignity of all, especially the marginalized? For the sake of the future of Europe, we as a cultural platform will stand up for the truth and we have, as we have recognized it, so that our Europe will continue to protect the dignity of all human beings. Thank you. Thank you, Christian Fry. And uh, uh, good luck for the cultural platform on the defense uh, of the right to all forms of life. Now, I would like to give the floor to Alter Arderlisten, philosopher, ethicist, author, and writer. He coordinates uh, ethical projects at the Linderbaum Institute. He is married and has four children. He comes from the Netherlands. Welcome. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, our youngest daughter, six year old, is called Beatrice. Beatrice, which means bringer of blessing or court fortune. It's a well known name in Europe. The Italian poet and writer Dante introduces her in his La Fina Commedia. There, 
Beatrice is given the task of accompanying Dante from the gates of heaven to God. After the poet Virgilius has guided him through hell and Mount Purgatory. We may ask, where in these three empires, hell, purgatory or heaven, do we find freedom? Freedom can be false, hellish, but in its essence, it's heavenly. Because the truth shall make us free. John chapter 8, verse 23. So the question of liberty must be linked to the question of truth. Freedom is one of the values that should characterize Europe. Freedom, however, is then seen as the accumulation of a maximum of individual choices. And that's a lie. In a community, freedom of one person is limited by the freedom of another. Only a blind ideology of absolute relativism fails to see this. I will mention two limitations. One limitation is often mentioned is responsibility. Freedom without responsibility descends into chaos, disorder. The prevailing rule then will be the right of the strongest. Taking away the right of others can never be the essence of freedom. Freedom for abortion leads to the destruction of innocent human life, just like the cultivation of embryos for scientific research. And freedom for a doctor to decide to atonize patients suffering for dementia is not the freedom that Europe should be promoting. Will the weak soon be sacrificed to the community in name of freedom? One of the tasks of the international pro-life movement is to unmask the untruth. A second limitation of freedom brings me to our daughter's second name, Emily. The name Emily is derived from a Greek word that means gentle or kind. And that brings us to the sphere of love. Unlimited love is the second limit of freedom. Love goes beyond offering the other person freedom. Love actively protects and cherishes the vulnerable, the unborn life, the disabled, the elderly who are dependent on care. Love should mark the thoughts and action of every community. The German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, weakness is sacred, therefore we dedicate ourselves to the weak. Weakness is not imperfection in the eyes of Christ, rather strength is imperfection and weakness is perfection. Not the powerful person is right, but ultimate, the weak person. Growth of freedom that goes hand in hand with growth of responsibility also means an orientation towards truth. I learned this from Joseph Ratzinger, the former Pope Benedict XVI. Freedom must be oriented towards truth. Freedom does not consist in the gradual abolition of rights and norms, but in the sanctification of ourselves, of our normative action. Our era of post-modernity and post-Christianity is sometimes referred to as post-truth era. The time of truth is said to be behind us. However, this idea that there is no more truth seems to me to be an extreme form of cynicism that only can be answered with hope. We must have to courage, the courage to ask the question about truth again and again, not out of cynicism, but out of the will to do good. The fact that truth makes us free points to Jesus Christ. He is the truth. It also urges us as pro life movement to stand for truth, for a responsible, honest handling of truth and truthful action. The third name of our daughter is Anastasia, a Russian name with Greek roots that means resurrection. Resurrection is about hope. There's hope for Europe because Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. He confirmed life, including physical existence, 
by the raising with a glorified body. Therefore, our life is an answer because we exist through and in the will of God. Speaking of freedom, faith in Christ make us free. With the reformer Martin Luther, we know this also leads to freedom of conscience. Ladies and gentlemen, in my opinion, summarizing, living in a free Europe means at last three things for the pro-life movements with regard to the truth. One, unmasking untruth. Two, promoting truth. And three, acting truthfully in responsibility and love. Only then we will all be Beatrices, bring us of hope, court fortune and blessing, not only for our generation, but especially for our sons and daughters. Thank you. Grazie ad Arthur Alder. Thank you, Arthur Alder Liston. There is uh, no freedom without uh, truth. It was a pleasure also hearing you mention uh, Dante and uh, Beatrice. We have been speaking about uh, weakness, about uh, weak people, and as a pro-life movement in Europe, we are weak. But uh, we are called to be open to hope. Now, how can we face a global threat in Europe? Let's watch the video first. The lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, non-binary, intersex and queer equality strategy adopted today is an important milestone towards achieving a union of equality. I ask for your support so that we can build together a more democratic, fairer and more fraternal Europe. In short, anti-fascist. Keep up the fight. Ci parla delle minacce globali in Europa. Ferenc Orsha will speak about global threats in Europe. He's a political philosopher. He studied in Budapest, Brussels, Oxford, and for 24 years he's been teaching at Catholic University in Hungary. He's been also the director of the Philosophical Academy and uh, he is currently working at a Budapest University. Philosophy and uh, policy in European cities is one of his last publications. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for the invitation uh, of me and with me, Hungary. I was born and brought up in the, uh, beyond the Iron Curtain in this beautiful country which was in those days under Russian communist oppression. Being a Catholic, I had to keep my religious education provided by an old lady, in fact, an earlier nun, whose religious order was banned by the communists and who came to our flat weekly to teach us the catechism and the most important stories of the Bible secret. 1990 was one of the happiest years of my, wife, of my life when the Iron Curtain fell down and we were allowed to travel to Europe without restrictions. In 2004, after 14 years of waiting in the lobby, my country, together with some other Central and Eastern European neighbors, was invited to join the European Union. That was still another Europe. 
much closer to the spirit of the movement initiated by Adenauer, Schumann, and de Gaspari after World War II. In the meantime, woke ideology, LMBTQ propaganda, and the sexual abuse scandal resulted in a general attack on the remnants of the Christian culture of Europe. In other words, the gender LMBTQ activism joined arms with the anti-Christian mobilization, and it resulted in a promotion of abortion and an attack on the traditional notions of marriage and the value of living in family. As a result, European nations show signs of innovation and a loss of vital energies. The dem demographic indicators of the nations of the continent most pertinently prove this. Only with a few exceptions, European statistics show a fall in demographic numbers. And what else is a good indicator of the potential of a community, but the tendency of its dem demography? Without a positive number of reproduction, no community can claim that it is in a rising phase. In fact, a failing number is an obvious proof that there is a decay in the backbones of a civilization. In that sense, what else is Europe but a declining civilization which is not ready anymore to defend itself? Let us repeat, we are living in a time of global threats. The COVID-19 epidemic is still with us and Europe once again has to live together with a renewed threat, a communist threat of the use of nuclear weapons as a result of the Russian attack on Ukraine. The challenge before Europe in this respect is whether it can, def it, it can find ways to set up its own forces of self-defense in order to keep a vigilant eyes on its borders. What is true in a military sense is also true in the cultural and spiritual sense. Europe needs to defend its historical spiritual achievements and with it the prospect of a promising future under constant attacks by the, the armies of radical ideologies of revenge and with the, the words of the late Sir Roger Scruton, the words of repudiation. We, we need the virtue of prudence and perseverance to defend our values. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's uh, be cautious when uh, defending uh, our values. And now we have a fifth session, a fifth panel. The introduction, as usual, uh, is in the form of a video, Nature, Soul and the Founding Fathers. We want to see a commission without Mr. Buttiglione as Justice and Home Affairs Commissioner. I was ready to do all what was needed for the success of the Barroso Commission. Uh, but, uh, Betraying uh, my faith or uh, betraying uh, my moral convictions. Ecco, per rispondere in fondo a questo grido. To reply to what uh, John Paul II said, uh, Europe, be yourself, uh, find yourself again. And um, I would like to now give the floor to Alois Petrele. He's been uh, 
MEP, he's been a prime minister in uh, Slovenia, he's been a minister as well in uh, Slovenia, and uh, his resume is much longer. You have the floor. Dear friends, I would say, dear future of Europe, I see so many young people here sharing the same values and principles. What the founding fathers of the European Union did after Second World War was the most conservative and the most progressive and historic decision at the same time. They put men at the center, not a leading country, a leading personality or an ideology. European Union began with the concept of men. Before the first community treaty was signed, they agreed on cultural foundation of the new European building, respect for human dignity of everyone. The concept of unity in diversity and concept of soft power are rooted in that fundamental equality. The first two articles of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which is part of Lisbon Treaty, read, human dignity is inviolable, it must be respected and protected. And the second, everyone has the right to life. Our problem has been that we don't agree who is the everyone. And what does it mean to respect human dignity in today's scientific, technological, societal and political environment? Europe is not able to agree who is the unborn or even denies that she or he is who. This means that we don't share the same understanding of man and life. But there is a question, how much can we do together if we don't agree on essentials? This is what the Conference on Future of Europe should be attentive to. The conference has a huge democratic, or was a huge democratic undertaking and brought many ideas from all member states. One can expect that in the end, the conclusions will reflect the prerequisite that our future in general depends on biology, spirituality, and ability to work together. Do we remember what Robert Schuman and Jacques Delors said? Europe cannot survive without its soul. Economy is not enough. And there is no need to say that soul presupposes life. I have the impression that those two men would have troubles in the European Parliament speaking in that direction today. We gather that here today, we gather here today because we believe that a good future for Europe can only be built on the foundations established by the founding fathers and strong culture of life. Decades ago, dignity was a key word. Today, such a word is life. We don't consider this an ideological but survival issue. Is there anyone who believes in a Europe without Europeans? or green Europe with more and more gray Europeans, a Europe just as a migration service, a Europe which does not believe in itself. We can green Europe demographically and in other respects only if we believe in ourselves, in our identity and mission of Europe based on its cultural roots. The war is in, in Ukraine is one more evidence that a strong Europe is needed. Eight years ago, freedom and peace were key words in Europe. The answer of the founding fathers to all totalitarianisms was based on two main ideas, respect for human dignity and to work as a community. Today, peace is still at stake. <laughs> willing to live with the others in a peaceful community, sharing the same basic values and principles, means more respect for life first of all. The war in Ukraine will finish, but the battle for the respect for life and dignity of the unborn will continue. 
Macron's idea cannot lead to a stronger Europe. I'm curious what Robert Schuman, Konrad Adenauer, or Alcide de Gasperi would share with us today. What would they tell Europe in this situation? Thank you for working. Thank you for working for a Europe of dignity and joy of life. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Petrle. Let's build Europe defending uh, dignity and uh, human light. Let's uh, redefine the concept of uh, human. Now let's move on to the conclusions. Remy Bragg, French uh, philosopher, will be here for the conclusions. I don't need to introduce him because he's very well known. He is uh, the reference of the cultural platform of one of us. Chers amis. Dear friends, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you. We uh, uh, today propose uh, to uh, widen uh, the, perspect uh, the perspective of uh, one of us and uh, to go to the core of our commitment, uh, which means that we want to clarify our idea of a man, uh, our anthropology, to put it a bit pretentiously. This is uh, no folklore that would be specific to a, a tribe on the verge of extinction. On the contrary, it is the foundation of uh, the civilization that we are lucky enough to inherit. It was more particularly the basis uh, of the project uh, uh, launched by the founding fathers of the European, Com the European Union. And, and it is not uh, by chance that we are holding this conference in the capital town of the European Union two days before the conclusion of uh, the Conference on the Future of Europe. What we uh, are to do is uh, to uh, remind us of Europe, but remind it to what? Uh, we we have to remind uh, Europe to itself. Uh, we have to remind Europe of the principles that uh, made it possible and uh, that uh, uh, enabled these uh, little cape of the Asian continent to achieve a historic success that uh, spans uh, several centuries and that no one could have foreseen. Speaking out on the uh, fundamental principles of the European Union, it cannot be taken for granted any longer. Indeed, uh, wherever we look, uh, we see a kind of uh, intellectual uh, of terror um, as uh, to uh, some uh, representations of the world and of mankind. It is a, a soft uh, terror, a boldless terror. Uh, it is uh, discreet, but uh, therefore all the more uh, discreet um, and e e efficient. It uh, uh, acts, uh, for instance, by excluding some issues and when we are promised a, a debate that is deprived of any taboos we can only bet that all questions will be tackled all except for those that would deviate from the compulsory position compulsory public opinion and this terror acts by sacralizing some supposedly irreversible advances blocked as they were they would be by a ratted on the cogwell of history. At the level of institutions, uh, the uh, said uh, terror uh, makes it possible for our tax money to uh, subsidize organizations uh, that work along the right lines, uh, very often against common sense. At the level of individuals, uh, it uh, delivers uh, who, uh, those who ask uh, the uh, said awkward questions uh, to the signaling of uh, media humorists, uh, to the systematic guilt tripping by our good apostles uh, have a spirit of openness. It promotes uh, the professional careers of those who think properly, whilst uh, blocking uh, those who are dissenting and who just think 
It gives a widest possible echo to uh, given ideas that it reverberates uh, uh, endlessly. Why it kills by silence? Uh, I think of the German verb Tochschweigen, uh, those who deviate from the right path. We are not uh, the first uh, uh, to feel such a pressure and uh, the first to try and resist uh, the pressure. The time has come to say who we are, um, what we are there to tell you. As for geography, the testimonies and reflections come uh, from a larger part of Europe. And when it comes to history, our attempt uh, is uh, to uh, be inscribed in a specific heritage, uh, the heritage of those who throughout history have offended for reason, freedom, uh, and uh, the dignity of each and every one of us. Um, these uh, didn't uh, wait for the enlightenment moment. But if you allow me, I would uh, uh, limit my uh, speech to more recent examples. Uh, um, 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 uh, thinkers who in the 30s and 40s uh, described uh, the misery in which uh, workers' families uh, were living. We have as our ancestors uh, the, uh, work, the uh, uh, workers of the labor movement. The protection granted uh, to workers had, had been done away uh, by uh, France uh, through the adoption of the Le Chapelier law. Uh, the workers' movement gave its new shapes, um, i.e. Uh, trade unions, cooperatives, and uh, mutual societies. Amongst our ancestors, uh, we also uh, have uh, parliamentarians who uh, passed the first uh, bills limiting child uh, labor, without forgetting, of course, those who prohibited uh, slave trade and then decided to abolish all, slave, all uh, forms of uh, slavery. As far as we are concerned, we consider our action as a direct uh, effect of uh, those, those uh, ancestors' actions. We do not uh, pretend we are uh, cleverer than they are or better than anyone else. But we think we have a better high side, sharper uh, eyes uh, than uh, many people around us, and more specifically, uh, a sharper eye than many uh, politicians. And what can we see that others do not? Well, it is simple. We see the human. We see the human where Others only see a biological structure, an economic actor, a political being. What we see is people who are free, who are intrinsically living in decent conditions, where others only see consumers, potential uh, voters, of, or even cannon fodder, if not sex objects. But here again, we uh, are part of uh, history and of different generations. Let's uh, uh, remember the situation in the ancient world where Christians began to spread uh, their uh, message. Um, the fullness of a human being was at that time a prerogative of adult males, of free status, as citizens of a city, whereas women, newborns and slaves were only partially human. This is a, a vision that, that was not only shared by uh, common people, it was shared by, by a, a great number of intellectual, of the intellectual uh, elite. Uh, if we uh, follow the principles of Aristotle, the females of human species were the result of an undercooked, uh, an undercooking of sperm. And for a famous uh, poet such as Homer, a person uh, becoming a slave would lose half of their qualities. 
As far as Plato was concerned, he has so no objection to the exhibition of uh, defective children. We talked about Sparta uh, earlier on, uh, and uh, um, Plato's vision was uh, rather Spartan at that time. Uh, and who were uh, unlucky enough to be uh, female and too small to defend themselves. And, which is the reason why a common man, a Greek worker from Egypt, would ride to his pregnant wife on the 17th of June, uh, first century BC. When you give birth, it is, if it is a boy, just leave it. If it is a girl, throw it away. The universalism uh, that uh, uh, was defended by uh, some Stoics uh, uh, to the elite was uh, spread to the masses by the Christians. Their activity could take as its program the sentence of a sample, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, a free man or slave, male or women male or female, sorry. And it is exactly uh, because of that broadened view that is capable of encompassing all the dimensions of the human being, all the uh, duration of life, all the levels of its development that we do not, uh, we refuse to play one of these dimensions against the other, men against women, rich against poor, learned against ignorant, adult against a child. And all these oppositions boil down to the same thing, the opposition between uh, the strong and the weak. And so, for, in, for instance, we try to uh, guarantee that women do not have to choose between uh, their careers and uh, their families uh, or between their partners and uh, the children they are carrying. And the refusal to oppose uh, those notions applies to us. We, uh, def we do not defend any group, not even the one uh, to which we happen to belong by birth or by choice. Uh, the only club we uh, recognize ourselves as member of is the human race. We do not defend any um, the interest of any uh, one in particular. We try to extend uh, the protection to those who can not yet, who cannot any longer, or who can not have their rights respected. Um, and so people will tell us, well, we're not obliging you to do anything. Why would you want uh, to prevent us from doing what we want? In other terms, your only choice is uh, to defend uh, your own uh, interests and not anyone else's interests. If this was the way we uh, would have considered things in the 40s, would there have been many writers amongst the nations? We can obviously accept such an attitude if the uh, if the other people uh, were able to defend themselves. But is this the case? We are more or less uh, uh, weak. Workers who are exploited can uh, create unions. Uh, the colonized people can revolt uh, uh, in a peaceful or violent way. But how can the unborn, uh, how can toddlers, the handicapped, the, the, the people suffering from COVID, so their right to life. Someone has got to voice their concerns or their situation. And today, what we stand for, in other terms, life, reason, the search for truth, freedom, equal dignity for all, all these uh, um, values uh, could be considered as a trivial or uh, could be taken for granted. Uh, there might have been a time where those principles were owned or shared, uh, where those values were not questioned and therefore there was no need to defend them or to further explain them. Those principles had uh, to uh, be uh, respected. We had to guarantee that they were respected and that was done uh, um, with the 
more or less uh, success. Uh, and this is the reason why we shouldn't rewrite history, make it, it more ideal than it used to be. Exam the examination of uh, conscience and repentance for the faults committed uh, by our civilization is uh, something that is uh, to be applauded, but we should not, uh, but it should not exempt us from the unpleasant duty of beating our breasts on our own and not conveniently on those of our ancestors. Whatever the uh, rosy or uh, uh, dark image of the past, uh, the fact is that we live in an age where the obvious has to be reasserted, uh, where the uh, um, uh, where trivial ideas have to be restated. Uh, and there is a risk that was prophesied uh, by Chesterton a century ago, when he said that, that a time would come when bonfires would be lit to burn those who dare remind us that two plus two make four, when swords would have to be drawn to defend the right to say that in the summer uh, the uh, tree leaves are green. And we've reached that, that situation. The question is a question of truth duty and the right to uh, look for truth, to understand it and to disseminate it. We uh, shouldn't uh, go for that uh, uh, individual truth that uh, we are constantly being told and we would like to uh, become paradoxically the common opinion. We are not talking about the truth of a country, a civilization, an era, an age group or a gender. We're talking about uh, the truth uh, of everyone, a truth truth that can be shared, the truth around, it, around which a, an authentic community can gather in peace. Solzhenitsyn, in, in its uh, letter to the leaders of the uh, Soviet Union, spoke of the uh, worst suffering inflicted by the ideological regime. It uh, was uh, not a scarcity, though manifested in the endless queues uh, outside shops. It was not the oppression and lack of freedom which were prevailing under Brezhnev uh, at the time when he was writing. He was referring to the obligation to line a life for those who wanted to survive. You had uh, to uh, preach exactly the opposite of what you were experiencing on a daily basis. Let's not forget that this was a socialist society in which social justice was a factor where abundance and freedom would reign, whereas uh, the reality was uh, obviously uh, considerably different. Nowadays, uh, we uh, we uh, hear a new type of lies in uh, part of the public space. Of course, uh, this uh, lie is not, or not yet, enforced by a political police. Our societies uh, prefer the discreet incitement of what uh, is uh, being called in English, nudge. Language of lies is uh, being written in uh, the law and refuses to uh, refusing to speak of truth uh, is already uh, paving the way for media ostracism and a risk uh, to um, end up in uh, social ostracism. Not speak our own language, speak another language is our is a task that we have to take up. But will we be uh, listened to or heard? Um, it is not our fault uh, that our weak voice is not heard in the concert, a concert that is very often silent. It is a deafening silence, the deafening silence of those who uh, think, uh, uh, who feel that they should uh, take the floor, but who um, alone uh, in uh, their beliefs uh, are uh, shying away and would rather have uh, people who are lying uh, take the floor. Why do we uh, speak out? Uh, we we didn't choose uh, to feel responsible, whatever the, whatever the number of uh, people. We have not chosen to have a duty to speak. And our only fright is that the next generations blame us for a lack of assistance to an endangered uh, uh, civilization. Who to us if we remain silent? Thank you very much.
Grazie davvero. Uh... Thank you very much, Mr. Bragg. Let us find again the fullness of uh, the human side in its origin. Let us be able to carry what is uh, clear, what is evident. We are approaching the conclusion of uh, today's convention. Let's watch together the final video, the closing video of the conference. The Polish government has no respect for fundamental rights. They neglect women, they disregard our bodies, and they put women's lives at risk. A oto nepochopiteľnejší pôsobí fakt, že na programe je opäť zaradená téma o tzv. sexuálnych a reprodukčných právach. Pretože práve vyhrotenou diskusiou sa odkylujeme od toho, čo by malo byť našim cieľom, a to je ochrana ľudského života, ľudskej dôstojnosti a práv každého jedného z nás. Ochrana zdravia, kvalitná zdravotná starostlivosť podkytovaná matkám a deťom a podpora rodinám. Todos debemos cumplir con la misión. We all must fulfill the duty of protecting each new life and may their tenderness fill us with hope. There are many of us who want and strive for this to happen in Texas, in the European Parliament and throughout the world. I would like to thank one of us, all the organizers, and before giving you some practical instructions, I would like uh, to conclude by thinking about Pope Francis, who spoke about the importance of women. Pro-life uh, volunteers are 80, 90 percent of women, he said. God always starts with uh, women. They have no doubts. They know the rebirth of humanity starts with women. They give life. They are the top of uh, creation. They protect life. They take care of everything. So let's stop abortion. This is what Pope Francis uh, is saying. We can be hope we can love ourselves for what we are as a woman i can love men thus we can create a new humanity as carlo casini said with conception we can create a new humanity one thing we're all invited to lunch but before you run to lunch I would like to ask uh, all speakers, all panelists uh, to come here for a family picture. Thank you, everyone.